Well, this is a story that Disney would not touch, but it's, it's from the same author of Beauty and the Beast and Cinderella, even though those are kind of, if you think about it, horrific stories as well. Certainly the original versions of them. And that's kind of what's so jarring about watching this film for the first time for both of us. Yeah, it's that we're, we're accessing classic fairy tale world and not Disney fairy tale world. Because there's so many elements of this film that, like, you couldn't do in the classic Disney era. I mean, in yeah. Cinderella, the, the stepsisters cut their toes off to be able to fit inside the slipper. Yeah. You know, like, that's... That's where we're going with and it, right? Beauty and the Beast was always is told to little girls as um, a way to soften the blow of arranged marriages. Yeah. So that's the, that's the whole basis of Beauty and the Beast as well. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. I'm Kyle from GoFromReviews.com. We're talking Jacques Demy's Donkey Skin. All right, welcome back to this new Patreon-selected episode. Yeah. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast, and thank you, Patreon, for selecting this film. This is obviously not a choice that we would pick, but uh, the Patreon picked us for us. Uh, if you're new, thanks for watching. Thanks for finding us. You can also um, look for us on Instagram and Twitter as well. And then also, if you like the Patreon, check it out for yourselves, and there's some great options provided. Today, we're going to talk about a French musical from 1970. Donkey skin. Yes, and this is from our patron Brian Eggert. So thank you, Brian, for selecting this yeah. very interesting film. Uh, Donkey skin is based on the classic fairy tale the king is grieving following the death of his wife. On her deathbed, the queen makes him promise to only wed again to someone more beautiful than she. He searches high and low for a suitable match, but the only member of royalty more beautiful is his daughter, the princess. Okay. Now, aided by her fairy godmother, the princess must disguise herself and flee the kingdom. Okay, well, that's a hell of a disguise yeah. uh, to get out of the castle. Um, this is actually a, a little bit of blend. This is late period of French New Wave. This is Jacques Demy. He did um, Umbrellas of Chabard, which is a fantastic one film. One of my favorite romance films of all time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this is him still working with, obviously, with colors, but it's a little more matted, I would say, than uh, Umbrellas was. Yeah, Umbrellas is very uh, pastel, and then he gets into the Young Girls of Rochefort, which I always mispronounce that. Um, the Young Girls is, is a little bit more, I think, vibrant, and then you get into this film, which gets to straight, like, it's almost a divided Technicolor, because yeah. you have the blue world and the red world. Like, there's these this yeah. idea that we're, like, separating our color palette, and it kind of creates two very distinct visual pieces, then. Right, yes. Um, so, you know, French New Wave is not so much... The, you know, get rid of the traditional filmmaking. It's actually used new filmmaking, but um, enhancing modern techniques of editing and sound and production and everything. Mm -hmm. This is actually going back to the traditional filmmaking. As you can see, they actually used the framing, like they did in silent films, mm. where flowers frame the picture. Yeah. Now, there's a very famous short film from, I think, from 1903 called The Fairy Flower Fairy, if I remember from my film school, mm. where the flowers just go around and then they pop in. And they do that to... When they do the show, the show the castle, the exterior yeah. castle, they have like a, you just put the branches up there. And, and in a lot of ways, too, yeah. it's funny because Whole that's actually film. how Disney does it with their full screen films on Blu rays. You can actually choose to watch their classic older films where they fill in the black the sides borders. with like a filigree or some sort of pattern to match it. And yeah. I like doing that when I watch the full screen Disney movies on Blu rays because it, it kind of just, again, it's blank space that you're using, that you're filling. And I think, yeah, this, the idea of us, you know, kind of jumping into this book and jumping out like into the story out of the story is again a yeah. very classic Disney-like uh, way of telling a fairy tale but I like that Demi is approaching this film and not he's not like taking away what makes this unique and dark but he's kind of using a, a Disneyfication of a dark fairy tale because this film is yeah. not dark and dreary but it deals with some dark and dreary elements it's very I would say very traditional method. there's a lot of just mount the camera mm -hmm. and just set it up and I was, oh, oh, at, this is my first time seeing it. I was like, why is he doing this? Because he obviously knows, when watching Umbrellas, he knows a variety of techniques, but there's a lot of framing. And I think he tries to get it from like a children's point of view of seeing this. Mm. Um, there's definitely a lot of basic, rudimentary film shots mm -hmm. that I'm really surprised that actually happened. It doesn't really get really flashy very much until the very end when you have the Carolina. Yeah, thing. and so and this this is actually my fifth to me film. Um, I, I saw many of his short films too, so I've seen Lola, Bay of Angels, Umbrellas, and Young Girls. Yeah. And, and the camera, you're right, it very rarely ever stops. And I think there's two reasons for that in this film that I could think of. Um, and one of them, I think, yeah, you're right, he does kind of, I think he wants a picturesque look. Like, yeah. in a way that so many comic book adaptations nowadays try to do a panel look, 
I think he's trying to do as if this could be an illustration right. on a page of a t fairy tale story. Yes, I um, think so. And then I also was thinking that he seems to get a little bit more experimental with post production work here, having some um, some some pacing with the the shot quality, and then also doing some reverse shots. I think there's a green screen with a dress that's made out of weather. I think there's like the that, first that use of a green like screen that. there. Yeah. Uh, so I think he knows that he's going to get experimental and. As someone who has dealt dealt with some really rudimentary filmmaking myself, I know that if you want to get weird and freaky with the post production, it is usually a little bit easier not to move the camera. Okay, <laughs> so I'm wondering if that might have been it too. He knew he was going to be doing something a bit more uh, elaborate after filming was done. That's but I think I'll also I think it gets the inspiration from you know the children's mm -hmm. color you know the illustrations from children's oh, books yeah. because if you have a, a very very centered picture esque of Catherine the you know, like kneeling and her father bleeding. Mm -hmm. But it's centered, so normally and it's like a student film. It's like, why is he doing this? There's some of the avenues, but I think he's right. He's trying to lift illustrations from a children's book to give it almost the children's book illustrations that are coming to life. Yeah, and in that way, it does create kind of a magical. It does have this magical quality of being feeling like I'm on screen with them. Yeah, you know, it kind of makes it feel a bit it more does. like a play. Yeah, you know, because you're just someone watching the play, and the goal of any play, of course, is to make you feel like you're up on the stage with them, experiencing it. That that level of reality crossing that really gets there and again to dealing with things like donkeys that defecate golden <laughs> treasures like yeah. we, we we cross the line into things that are completely outlandish by today's standards but they were part of that fairy tale aesthetic and i like that he doesn't shy away from that no and that definitely used in this story that something disney would not even touch you know the uh, the, the king who wants to marry his daughter to keep because she's the most beautiful thing in the land oh, yeah and that's something that they would probably definitely would not even touch but you know, they're comfortable doing that, especially French New Wave is all about breaking barriers. Yep. So let's do it. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is costuming really is not the overbearance. It's almost filled in the environments. I, I think, a little yeah, bit. because the environments, you know, some of these non-castle environments, pop. yeah, if they feel over elaborate to me. They feel like they're kind of cartoonish yeah. at times. And especially when you get the part of the story where she wants the dress that's made out of weather, the one that's made out of the sun and the moon, I believe. Yeah, the well. moon one is kind um, of the The moon one is the one where it's like, oh, I wouldn't wear that. But the other two, yeah. you know, were I interested, I'd, I'd <laughs> right. both of those. Out of, the, <laughs> out of three, I would, yeah. Yeah. So it's almost like uh, pitting that to see how much he would do for her. Yeah, and I like that she's... Uh, that she's just kind of like trying to push the button to see like, like what will it take for you to move your interest elsewhere? Yeah. And I, I like that there's that steadily building. And that's again, another facet of those kind of classic fairy tales is that usually it's the repetition of like, you know, do this for me. I've done this for you. Okay. We'll do this for me. Like it's, it's that kind of repetition of the whole piece. And, and, Mentioning that this is ba based on a story from the same person that did Cinderella and Beauty and the Beast, there's a lot of Cinderellian parts to this film. Right, you go you know? from Empress to down to the village, mm -hmm. and then you come back. And, and instead yeah. of the the shoe, we have the ring, and like we have like these elements yes. that are very similar. I wasn't 100 percent certain because I've never read the, the fairy tale itself. I was thinking that this was more actually a remake or a adaptation of Cinderella until I took and found out. Oh, this is this is actually a donkey skin as well. <laughs> yeah, it definitely has a type. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so definitely color distinctions, color separations, using costuming that's just over almost overbearing, almost mm -hmm. yeah, our, oh gets to almost a little bit to the cartoonish, the ridiculousness, but it's also a little bit ultra modern. I mean, the Queen's tomb that's super sixty. <laughs> it's that like yeah. Yeah, and the, the play like with a, that is interesting because again, I, I'd heard from all these people before I'd watched the film. They're like, "Wait till you get to the helicopter," and I'm like, "How would there be a helicopter in this movie? Like, yeah. in what way would you ever do that?" And again, yeah. he kind of it, he just inserts it, and we're just oh, we're going with that. Like that's that's just kind of a passage over right there. I always wondered about that once I saw this film. Uh, like, spent my entire couple days going like, "Why the helicopter? Like, why why the use of the modern?" With those changes, it didn't I, take me out of the film because well, I, I think was already it's, past it. You know, I have a deal with theory. Is just because that's part of the French New Wave is we not not breaking down the traditional. We're using traditional filmmaking, but we're incorporating new. And mm. it's always a splash of something new. Whether it's just the adult, you know, the tomb itself, yeah. the helicopters of using colors. Everybody's got blue face and all that stuff on there. And so there's a little bit of blending, and that's really the emphasis of kind of where Jock the Beat comes from. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And I like that there are, again, uses of very simplistic kinds of, of you know, editing tricks. I like the yeah. the, the running the, the film backwards to get the dress that comes out of the, 
the box, you know, or them rolling or the fairy up tale. the hill. Or yeah, yeah. The fairy tale leaving. Yes. Which is very obviously with reverse filming. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. one of those one kicks. And French Roulette, really, the whole foundation, because I actually was going to criticize because I was like, Jack Denis is just doing this basic filming. Why is he doing that? And I was just going to like, this, that's not what I regard as a French New Wave, but I remember the whole emphasis, the meaning of French New Wave is just to film movies of the absurdity, the ridiculousness of just the existence of life. Mm -hmm. Just put a helicopter. Why? Well, why not? Yeah, and there's an elevated <laughs> sense to everything. And that's, I mean, that's especially when you get to Demi's um, musical films. I think it's the first two features I'd seen, Lola and Bay of Angels, are a little bit more grounded um, than yeah. anything else. But once you get to his musical level, he does kind of play up a little bit absurd, a little bit brighter, and it makes his films more enjoyable because they stand they stand on their own. Like, you can see one of his films and say, that's him, you know? Yeah, even though there's a lot of basic, all right, enter the scene and everything, but still, you get when you enter the King's Throne, you have to go under. It's almost like a child entering its little fort. Mm, yeah. It's almost like that. So I really think it's the emphasis of a child's point of view watching this movie. Mm. Yeah. And, well, I would also point out, too, when we mentioned kind of the difference in filming styles, that's why I keep going back to this idea of he might have been prepping for a more interesting post-production is that he yeah. did use a lot of the same people over and over again he had okay. the same music musician uh, uh michel legrand and then cinematography by Ghislaine cloquette who did the young girls just a few years prior as well so like using the same people there was yeah. obviously a, a change in that choice and i do think yeah the post-production piece and placing it off trying to be a more painted look to it which is very successful to me yeah so <laughs> I, I do like that mine that was covered in it the, oh, mine, I, the, 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 the red prints of the Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that was classic. It was yeah. like, yeah, that's totally French film there. And we're talking about pastries and making stuff. And all that. Uh, you know, and that's the funny it thing. It does get a little bit over the French, which I do enjoy. I'm, yeah. I'm surprised to say that I'm, I'm very joyfully giving a, a recommendation to a film that features both a song about not incest <laughs> and a song that, that teaches you how to bake a cake. That let me point out, that's not the way to bake a cake. Listen to the song if you try it. I mean, but it's, it's not like going to work well. But, right. Yeah, but I will gladly enjoy the song. It's watching. I love the idea that there's the duet between Catherine Deneau and Catherine Deneau. Between yeah. the donkey her and the, and the real her. I like that there's the dichotomy of that. And I like that, yeah, the pastry song. Um, and Or I guess their love, their love ballad when she meets the beautiful prince. And their idea of love is so, so simple. It's the simple pleasures of like they're at a table eating pastries. And I'm yeah. like, well, that's the Frenchest thing I've seen in a while. <laughs> so there's, right, yeah, and then I, was, I definitely put on my notes because I caught myself. This is actually simplicity. Mm -hmm. I think it's really for kids and I, I don't want to repeat myself but it, it's just the simplicity of, oh, we're in love. Well, let's tumble down the hill like kids do yeah. and all that stuff. Let's frolic. A lot of frolicking and stuff and like, you know, making food and dressing up and all that stuff. So it's very much adhere to how a kid's perspective of seeing this and you know adults looking at it from oh i remember this as a kid yeah. yeah and us viewing this film 50 years later we put we put the the disney like Staple ideals on it and yeah, that's why we kind of see it as kind of an odd piece that's what i cut myself the, right the like incestuous kind of nature of the king but i've seen a lot of people talk about how like you know, this is a story from Demi's childhood. He read this story growing up, and he always wanted to make a film version of it. He'd been writing the script and working on it since 62. Yeah. And it took eight years before it finally hit the screen after he started the project. And I, I think when you see it from that perspective, he's not embarrassed by the... He's content. not trying to cover up the content of the fairy tale like no. so many Disney films have done. Uh, he's kind of just embracing, like, it is supposed to be a little unnerving in a way. That's why we, that's why we want the daughter to get away from him. You know, and I like that he's not shying away from that in such a way. No, it's but always, he is making a film for kids. You're right. Yeah, it's always about um, not really getting out of what your destiny, your destiny, like finding what authentic love is, rather mm -hmm. than just arrangements, and rather just keeping you know what you want. It's true. It kind of matches the arranged marriage idea to the idea of the incestuous king, yeah. to kind of like again like double place the idea that this is. This is wrong. We want to veer away. And I like that the fairy godmother comes in and she's like, no, 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 we're not doing that. <laughs> you know, the fairy godmother is the, the moral compass driving us away from from all the kind of treachery of it. And like you said, with Beauty and the Beast being, you know, on the idea of arranged marriages, he's kind of, again, playing with that territory. And they have, you know, they encapsulate because a lot of the, there's so many flowers mm -hmm. traced in there, not in just in the villages, but inside the the. the castles yep. and stuff there's the arrangement of flowers there's like paper mache flowers too like a float flowers so it's decorative very careful decoration mm -hmm. but it's also very childlike decoration as well yep 
So and and looking at that visual appeal too, uh, it's Demi's one of his favorite films too was the 1946 Beauty and the Beast adaptation. Uh, and so you yep. can see there's a lot of similarities in the visual aesthetic, even though that film, of course, being in the 40s, was not as colorful as this one is. That's but there right. are a lot of but it's the same visual actor, right? ones. Yep, and they got uh, Jean Marais, who plays the king, was also the beast in that film. So yeah. we've got some kind of callbacks to that nature. So again, you see that, that evolution of the fairy tale on film taking place here. Yeah, that's that blending of traditional filming and borrowing from what we've seen before and just trying to make it a little more encapsulated into the 60s a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, there's that natural progression that's really fun to watch when you see a filmmaker. When you see a filmmaker who grew up on something from the 40s, making something in the 70s, we get filmmakers all the time who talk about films in the 70s influencing them. In yeah. The 2000s. Like it's that, that yeah. natural progression that's really fun to watch here. And I think um, I, I'm surprised by a lot of the elements of the film because I've been looking forward to this one for a while. I've owned this film does. set yeah. for a while, yeah. and I've been like working my way through Demi's filmography. Um, so, so having the chance to actually watch this and see that natural progression is really fun. Uh, director Giacomini's wife was uh, another French Monet, French New Wave filmmaker, and that was Agnes Vargas. And I wonder how much input she had on this. I know that she was she Very was well involved time. on set for a number of his films. Yeah. Um, she did some. I think in the Young Girls, she appeared as a nun in like the background, but she was always kind of like at his side when he was making these films. It seemed so. You've got to assume that there's some level of of interaction between them. I think that's yeah. the great thing when you have two filmmakers who are that close together, being able to push ideas off each other and give feedback. Uh, and she also was very integral in the remastering of these films when they were brought back out uh, from the Criterion transfer. Yeah, they're very famous that uh, they, they, they filmed it on the wrong stock for Umbrellas for Chaborg, and they, mm -hmm. they spent an incredible amount of money getting the color and the restoration to come back, and yep. I think she was part of that project. She was very involved with that. So it's, yeah. you know, I think... Having him pass away before her, I'm sure she spent some, a good amount of time trying to make sure that his legacy was sustained. Yeah. Um, we will have to talk some Varda films at some point, because I also yeah. do have the giant box set for that one, so I'm going to have to open that. Like Kung Fu Masters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, yeah, overall, it's a great experience. And like I said, it's gonna. I, I got trapped in the notion of, well, French New Day was for explorers do the color, exotic angles and the long editing cuts and all that stuff in play. But no, it's going back to what we see for a fairy tale story is traditional filming. Just mm -hmm. basic, rudimentary. Make the dresses with cartoonists. It's all the emphasis of almost a kid's point of view of a fairy tale. Yeah, and, and one of the ways I like to critique movies is being able to look at them through today's lens. And yeah. so I also was very like very impressed by this film being able to tear away the Disneyfication of fairy tales and see one on display like that. I think yeah. overall I was very, very... Uh, I was very warm to the idea of watching this movie. And it's actually, again, of the five features I've seen from me, this is probably my second favorite on first viewing, right after Umbrellas. I, agree, I was yeah. very taken by Donkey Skin. Um, and it's one that, because it was not exactly what I was looking for, that may have made me enjoy it more. It was not exactly the right. way I expected it to play out. Yeah, because after, I, you know, I have to admit, I have never heard of this movie. I've never really heard of it. I've, I've maybe been passing and everything. We never really had a copy at the video store. I've never had you know people talk about this movie. I had a grandmother who loved Disney fairy tale stuff. I've never heard of this thing. Well, it also wasn't easy for us to find. Well, as no, we saw, we, we had con he contacted me and he was like, "Can I can I get your copy of it?" Because I had a copy and you couldn't get one. So yeah. it's also not a very easy film to come across. I only have it because I'm a Criterion collector who has a lot of problems with spending too much money and I bought the box set purely because I heard it was great I heard it was French colorful musical man and so and I got, yeah, 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 so I yeah, got what it. I needed out of it yeah. my, maybe my only criticism being that since I am such a fan of the the musical work of Jacques Demy, I would have liked more songs in the film. I agree. I, that I a, thought I would thought we were going to get a, this bombarded with musicals. And well, and Umbrellas is straight music. God, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think uh, Un Chambre de Ville was another one like that he followed up with this, was another singing from beginning to end, whereas Young Girls was more musical-based, where there were songs, but yeah. then there was action and dialogue, songs, action. Yeah. And I think that was where I, I was told by a lot of people that the first half of this film is better than the second half, and I disagree because the second half is the music I really liked. Um, that's where the music kicks in a little bit more, and we get a little bit more. I did like the second choice. act. Yeah, yeah, I did like that. The first act is a little bit like we have the establishing shots of like a lot of the setup, which is kind of a little bit of play of the you know of the people are blue and everything mm -hmm. is blue and almost like well, isn't blue the sacred color of France? Of course. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're going to play well a lot with the blue and the options of blue. Blue is my favorite color, too. So, yeah. yeah. 
Um, and yeah, I was surprised of the amount of not so much of, of the music that was in. I, I thought it would be. Yeah, yeah. I thought it'd not be just the amount of music, but I wanted more because I really like the way yeah. he deals with music on screen. God, that has to be like a record made of this or something. At some point, yeah. yeah. Um, and I also was very taken with Catherine Deneuve, but then again, I've I've, I've been in love well, with Well, once she was on board, then so, they could do the movie, right? Once yeah, she got the financing for them for this movie, which again, like that's that's kind of the benefits of having a great actress that you can go to and say, hey, we've made a couple movies together. Can you help me? <laughs> she but, was great in April, uh, I think it's April Fool's Day. Okay. Jack Lemmon, 1969. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've not seen that one. I know we've talked about uh, her voice work in Persepolis. Um, and yeah, just being able to... I, I, I just love this actress. I think she's she's a stunning presence on film. Um, I like the, the joke that I saw on Letterboxd. Sorry, I don't remember the name of the guy who posted this on Letterboxd. But he said, it, this film just uh, solidifies the fact that the only person more beautiful than Catherine Deneuve is Catherine, Catherine Deneuve. Deneuve and she's that's why you have to play her both roles, the mother and the daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and she plays bewildered. Yeah. Wonderfully. Yes, yeah. I know. I, that's right. I guess that's the kind of the key too is, you know, looking at it through today's lens. You see yeah. her; she could play bewildered with a, you know, I'm a blonde and I don't know what's going on kind of way if the film were made today. Yeah, I remember. But she's like, able to play it with a childish innocence that really, really works well. Yeah, I think Jack just wanted to hire because of her hair was so bleach white. Yeah, yeah. In case he wanted to change it into a Rapunzel adaptation <laughs> or something. <laughs> All right. Okay. I've never heard of this movie. Thank you, Brian. Uh, have you heard of this movie? I yeah. Got, yeah. Definitely. Let us know in the comment section. I mean, down I, below. I know Jack to me. I've been watching Umbrellas, and I didn't hear of this movie. I yeah, and I know it's it's streaming right now on the Criterion channel, but outside yeah, of that, it's very tough to come by. So either get that Criterion box set, because honestly, if you get it during a sale, it's only like sixty five dollars, and I think it's really worth it. Um, if you if, if you it's get the chance, so stream see, the yeah. film on the Criterion channel or find a copy of it, because we do very much recommend this. And thank you, Brian, again, yeah, for for recommending the film for us. Uh, let us know in the comments down below your thoughts on Donkey Skin. And while you're down there. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, and check out that Patreon as well, where you can join others like Brian in picking our monthly uh, Patreon picks. Yeah. Once again, everybody, I'm Kyle from uh, GoFromReviews.com. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast, and I'm going to find myself a rich donkey to yeah. uh, kick out jewels for me. And my cat doesn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>